All right, today's session, it's second to our last session. Ha ha, next week we will finish off everything dealing with the central auditory nervous system being the brain. But this week, <clears throat> We'll continue where we, where we left off last week. Last week, we finished off cochlear physiology, and then we went into this section, Unit 7, and we talked a little bit about the eighth nerve. And that's kind of where we'll pick up again today. So I'll share screen. All right. We're all back. Four squares. Here we are. Okay. And we'll pull up our notes from last week. And oh, by the way, yes, I went into the um, Acoustics 110 and I uploaded Unit 6 notes while we were away. So that's finally done. Apologies there. I have no idea why that screwed up, but nonetheless, it somehow did. Anyway, when we are looking at the nervous system, we've left the ear and we're following the eighth nerve to the brain from the cochlea. And in order to talk about the eighth nerve, we really should get a better handle on what the heck is a nerve. So let's look at nerves. What the Sam Hill are these things? So you see at the top of your page, CNS, brain and spinal cord. That means central nervous system. So your brain has a tail and it goes all the way down to your rear end called your spinal cord. Okay, your spinal cord really is part of your brain. It's the primitive part of your brain. Think of if you have your, your legs crossed and a doctor taps your knees and your foot shoots out. That message went from your knee to your spinal cord and right back out to your foot to kick. When you put your hand on a hot burner of a stove by accident, you've touched the hot burner of a stove and you pull your hand back like right away. That message never got all the way up to here. That message went from your hand up your arm to your spinal cord and right back out to your muscles of your arm. It never, you didn't go, hmm, perhaps I should remove my hand or there will be scalding skin. It was a reflex. So anything that goes to the spinal cord and right back out again is a reflex. It required no thought on your own. Think of an example in hearing, your acoustic reflex, the little muscles that pull on your middle ear bones. A loud sound comes in your ear through the cochlea, eighth nerve, and then back from the brain stem, from the brain stem, which is simply the spinal cord inside your skull. So the message went from the eighth nerve to the, to the brain stem and then out the fifth cranial nerve and out the seventh cranial nerve to the tensor tympani muscles and the stapedius muscle to pull. You had no control over it. It was a sound that created the acoustic reflex. A reflex is something that went afferently to your central nervous system and back out again, but it never went to your brain brain. It never went to your cortex. It just went to your spinal cord or brain stem and then back out. That's what they call reflex actions. It's just you had, didn't think about it, it's a reflex. It's just no thought involved. So now we'll share a screen again and follow our notes. Peripheral nervous system, PNS. That's all the other nerves in your body. So whatever your, your arms, your legs, fingers, whatever, peripheral nervous system. So I'll give you a quiz question here. The eighth nerve, is it part of the central nervous system or part of the peripheral nervous system? Then you would answer peripheral nervous system. How come? Even though it's in your head, it's not part of your brain and it's not your spinal cord. If it's not your brain and not your spinal cord, it's the peripheral nervous system. So, PNS includes your spinal nerves that come off your spinal cord, your cranial nerves that come off of your brain stem, and smaller tertiary nerves. So, having a look here at this picture, you're looking at a spinal cord going down, and you have 31 pairs of nerves going off of it. And then you go into the skull. From right up here, you enter the skull, and now you're in the, the brain stem, 
which is just the spinal cord inside your skull, and you're looking under, you're looking at the brain this way, and you have 12, I should say 12, okay, 10 and 2, you have 12 pairs of cranial nerves coming off of your brain stem. And the eighth pair is your auditory nerves. And look where your auditory nerves meet. They meet right at this junction, this weird little M. So if you follow that eight, you're going in, 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 follow the arrow right there. You'll have the vestibular portion and the auditory portion. You can see right where my cursor is, two little nerves there. And look where the seventh facial nerve is, seventh, 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 right there as well, right by it. Okay, so your seventh cranial nerve and your eighth cranial nerve. Your seventh nerve is your cheek, controls your cheeks, smiling. It sends a message to the tensor tympani muscle to contract, okay? And the eighth cranial nerve is a sensory nerve that sends info to your brain. Back to the notes. Spinal cord, then, is actually part of your brain. The brain can be thought to have a long tail. Many neural messages go along nerves to spinal cord and back again. Always think of it as a loop. Always. Things go to the central nervous system and back out from the central nervous system. It's a, as they'd say in German, it is nicht ein Einbeinstrasse. It is not a one-way street. It's a two-way street. Afferent is brain going. Efferent is brain leaving. Okay, every message has to get to the central nervous system, whether it's the brain, brain, or the spinal cord. Doesn't matter if it's the spinal cord or brain stem, it's a reflex. If it's the brain, it's a thought. But nonetheless, things go to and then back out. So here we go. Many neural messages go along the nerves to spinal cord and back out again. They never reach the cortex. These are called reflexes. Knee reflex, instant recoil from hot stove, acoustic reflexes. They think I wrote these notes. Neural messages that actually go all the way to the brain, reactions involving conscious thought and awareness. Think of the first time you've tied a shoe. Think of when you're trying to find directions for the first time how carefully, how your behavior is while you're doing something for the first time. And then later on when you get used to something. Now this is where we need to think about old brain and new brain. This is the new brain, the wrinkles. When you're looking at a picture of the brain with all the, the wrinkles in it, that's your neo brain, N-E-O, new brain. Your old brain is your brain stem and spinal cord. That's your ancient, evolutionarily primitive brain. So the larger the mammal, the larger the cerebral cortex is, or the more advanced the mammal is. And now bring it back to us again. Think about tying a shoe when you were six years old, and your mom or dad taught you how to tie a shoe. Make the two bunny ears and da 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 and so you tried to follow that, okay? After a while, you got so used to it, you don't even look at your shoe. You're going, rrr, rrr. that's because you've now relegated that task to a more ancient part of your brain, a more, a part that just looks at patterns. And same with directions when you're driving for the first time. You're looking at your GPS and you're, go this way. No, idiot, you passed the stop sign, you know, this kind of stuff. And you're listening to that, and your whole brain is involved. After you've done it a few times, you're just, you're not even thinking about it. Your new brain is busy thinking about other things, okay? You've relegated that task to a more ancient part of your brain. So always kind of think in, in, in terms like that, and it's kind of, I don't know, it's, it's kind of fun. <laughs> All right, here we go. Neural messages that go all the way to the brain. After a while, you get used to something and you develop a pattern. And when this happens, the activity is relegated or delegated to a lower part of your brain. Now we've got to look at the typical neuron building blocks of the nervous system. So let's take a look at a nerve. 
<clears throat> here's a typical neuron. Now remember, nerves are bundles of these. Remember we looked at the eighth, <clears throat> excuse me, the eighth nerve? And we went to the eighth nerve and took a peek at that puppy. Here, the thousands and thousands of fibers of the eighth nerve. Okay, these fibers are called neuron fibers. So your nerve, the eighth nerve, is actually a bunch like a rope, a twisted rope of thousands and thousands of little threads. And each of those threads is called a neuron fiber. So now you're looking at a typical neuron fiber, just one of these guys. And what you're seeing is a cell. This is what feeds the nerve. And then you're looking at a long arm, and it ends in these little buttons. Now look at the arm. It's got hot dog buns on it. Okay, you can just see the hot dog buns all the way along. Okay, those hot dog buns are white. They are fat. They're called lipids. Now they are like the insulation around an electrical wire. They're like the rubber on an electrical wire. They insulate the wire. Because otherwise, if the two wires touch each other, you're going to get a short. So you want to insulate it. Now, what happens in people who have MS, multiple sclerosis? MS, they're losing that white, fatty tissue. They're losing the insulation around their neuron fibers. And that's called multiple sclerosis. Anyway, this neuron fiber is what we call multipolar. It's got lots of little arms here and then one long big one. This is called the axon, O-X-A-X-O-N, and these are called the dendrites. They look like little tree branches, quite a bit like tree branches. So if we escape out of here now and go to our next somewhere here, oh yeah, so the, the arm is white because it's covered with fatty hot dog buns, so to speak. And the, this area here is gray. It's not covered with the hot dog buns. Now that's where we get the notion, and that's where you may have heard, if any of you studied nursing or biology, you've got gray matter and white matter. Okay, the gray matter is unmyelinated. Myelin is the hot dog buns. Myelin is the fatty, the, 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 the coat, the, the insulation. So the, the insulation is white, and the axon under in, inside is gray. And the cell body with all those little arms sticking out, well, that's gray. So you have gray matter, white matter. You know, a good way to think about your brain is to take a piece of broccoli or cauliflower, and you got that whole thing, and just cut it right down the center. And when you cut broccoli or cauliflower down the center and then turn it this way to look at it, you're going to see all the florets on the outside. Think of that as the gray matter. And then these, uh, 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 these arms going down. And that's white matter. Okay? So the long, the, the, the long tentacles are white and the cell bodies are gray. You have gray matter and white matter in the brain. Share a screen again. What other lies can I tell these fine people? Okay, so you have a cell body, nourishes the neuron. They call that tropic function. Don't worry about it. Dendrites, I think that's Greek for tree, tree branches because that's exactly what they look like. They're usually short. They receive the information from the neuron. And then the axon is the axis or long cylinder. It's a longer single arm that sends information away from the neuron, and synapses are where the two or where two nerves can touch. So if you look at what a synapse is, well, let's go here. Okay, here's a neuron fiber. Here's a neuron fiber. They each have a cell body that's gray, the dendrites, long arm called an axon, and then this touches the dendrites, almost touches, doesn't quite touch the dendrites of the next neuron which sends info up its axon. So if you take a close-up now at this little bulb, at the end of that little bulb, and take a close-up, and what you're going to see, there's that bulb, 
And there's actually a little space between it and the next neuron. They call that the synaptic cleft. So these little neurotransmitters, when the nerve is talking to the next neuron, they move to the end of that bulb and shoot out little spores that get picked up by the next neuron. And that's partly what goes wrong when one has Parkinson's disease or these other pathologies, Lou Gehrig's disease and these other things. You get problems with the neurotransmitters sending things from neuron to neuron, okay? Just a little bit of neuroanatomy is what we're covering here. That's all. So myelin, if you follow down with the page here, myelin is that fat, whitey, white sheath. It's like the hot dog buns. And it lines the neuron fiber. It allows electrical transmission along the axons. Gray matter is unmyelinated neuron cell bodies. And now here's where you got to, we, we make our, our, our four part distinction. Bundles of white myelinated neuron fibers in the peripheral nervous system are called nerves. Hence, hence eighth nerve. Okay? In the central nervous system, remember when I talked to you about the cauliflower or the broccoli? slice that then you're talking about your head okay you've got the bumpy florets on the top think of that as your cortex and then the big arms the white matter going down those are called tracts t-r-a-c-t-s so in the central nervous system your head and your spinal cord the white matter long bundles of neurons that way are called tracts in the peripheral nervous system, bundles of these axons or white matter are called nerves. So you can already see that the term nerves is overused by the public to mean all of it. It isn't. Nerves are just white, myelinated, long arms, axons in the peripheral nervous system. In the brain and spinal cord, those very same things are called tracts. Okay? That's your first distinction. And now we go to our second distinction. Groups of unmyelinated neuron cell bodies in the peripheral nervous system are called ganglia. Now, you learned in cochlear anatomy, spiral ganglia. And those were those weird olives. They look like eyeballs. Remember we looked at that? The areas inside the cochlea that come from the inner hair cells and are leaving the cochlea and you have all these little bulb, 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 these little bulbs, spiral ganglia. In the anatomy of the cochlea, remember there's three spirals. There's spiral ganglia, spiral lamina, spiral ligament. That's because everything goes around in the cochlea. It goes on a spiral. I can't help it. I didn't make it up. Okay? So, Spiral ganglia is a gang or a group of gray matter cell bodies in the peripheral nervous system. And in the central nervous system, those same kinds of things would be called nuclei. Nuclei. So you know you have four terms. Nerves, tracts, they're white. Ganglia, nuclei, they're gray. Live long and prosper. Gray area, white area. Okay, think about it. Okay, so there you have it now. Now let's look at the eighth nerve. And we'll look at some pictures. All right, go back up to here. Where were we? Oh, yeah, here's a little categorization of terms, what we just talked about. Okay, nerves, bundles of white axons in the peripheral nervous system. Tracts, bundles of white axons in the central nervous system. Ganglia, bundles of gray areas in the peripheral nervous system. Nuclei, bundles of gray areas, bodies in the central nervous system. Told you. Okay. Here is another breakdown, and it goes to regarding our notes, and our notes are talking about it right here. Bipolar. This does not mean that the eighth nerve is really happy and then it gets really depressed. That's, that's a, more of like a mental disorder, bipolar. Okay? All right. We're not talking that. Multipolar, look at this left neuron. It's got tons of arms, all these weird arms, all these dendrites, and then a long axon, and it might even break off into a couple of branches. Multipolar. 
okay? This neuron on the right is bipolar. It's got a cell body here and two arms, one there and one here. Okay, it doesn't, we're not talking dendrites and axons, it's got two axons, one here, one here. Bipolar. Now, bipolar neurons are always sensory. They might be for vision, might be for smell, taste, hearing, all your senses, bipolar neurons. Bipolar neurons are afferent. They send info to the brain. That's why this bipolar neuron is sitting and it's attached to an inner hair cell. Here's an inner hair cell. And there's the stereocilia of the inner hair cell. So eighth nerve neurons are attached to inner hair cells. And what do inner hair cells do? They send info to your brain. How? By connecting it to the eighth nerve and sending it to your brain. So your eighth nerve is like a head with two arms. Okay, here's the cell body, the gray area, and the two arms sticking out the side. One arm goes to the inner hair cells, and the other arm goes to the brain stem. Cool. Okay, multipolar neurons are always motor neurons. They're always efferent. Multipolar neurons go in the opposite direction. Multipolar neurons come from the brain to the body. So multipolar neurons innervate muscles, okay? Your muscles to contract, to squeeze my fingers, okay? I'm getting multi, I'm, motor neurons are telling, from my brain are telling my fingers to squeeze, okay? That's motor information. Sensory information goes the opposite direction, to the brain. So sensory information neurons are bipolar, Motor neurons, which go from the brain to the limbs, are efferent, and they are multipolar. Cool? Got the distinction? Good. So now you've got several different things to kind of juggle here, just to bug you. All right, so let's read what we have. Eighth nerve is bipolar. Sensory, afferent neurons go to the sensory nervous system. Olfactory, smell, vision, hearing. These are relatively few in number. Relatively few compared to motor neurons. Motor neurons are multipolar. They're efferent because they return from central nervous system back to muscles or glands. And there are more of them. And then you have tiny interneurons, which include everything between the above. About a trillion of those puppies in the brain. Okay? Let's look at the anatomy and physiology of the eighth nerve itself. Now that we've categorized neurons in general, let's place the eighth nerve in its context and we'll look more specifically now at the eighth nerve. The eighth nerve goes from the spiral ganglia of the cochlea through the internal auditory meatus to the brainstem. Now, hang on a second. We've got to define what the Sam Hill internal auditory meatus is. Okay, here's your eighth nerve fibers coiled like a rope. Let's take a different close-up. Okay, look at this carefully. And to blow it up, I'm going to try and make it larger so you can see it better. Now, look at here. This would be the scala media. Okay, follow my cursor. Scala media filled with endolymph, hair cells, okay, it's membranous labyrinth going all the way around, and it's filled with inner and outer hair cells, and look at these little bumps. Those little bumps are the spiral ganglia, okay? So the eighth nerve can be thought to be had one short little axon and one much longer one. It's a bipolar neuron. The cell body would be my thumbs, and one axon is really short, and it goes from the spiral ganglia to the eighth nerve, I mean to the, to the inner hair cell. So it goes from here to here, okay? Just a short little axon from here to here. The longer axon, eep, all the way to the brainstem. How long is your eighth nerve? One inch. In Canada, we say two and a half centimeters. 
Okay? You all in Trump land, you say one inch. Now, always remember what a centimeter is. Take a look at your fingernail. That's a centimeter. Two and a half of those puppies stuck together is about an inch. Okay? So if I flip you the bird, basically you're getting a centimeter. A centimeter, centimeter, centimeter. Okay, basically. All right, good. So we're looking at the length of the eighth nerve. If you've got 12 pairs of cranial nerves, the eighth pair is the, eight, is the uh, acoustic nerve, the hearing nerve, and it's the shortest of all of your cranial nerves. The shortest one. So again, here's the spiral ganglia. I, you know, I can, just to make sure, just, just for fun, let me just pull up a picture so I can show you another way of looking at the spiral ganglia here too. Why not? Just so we've got it. Okay, I'm going to go over to here, inner ear anatomy. That's eh, not the slide I wanted. Eh, come on, close that puppy. Close that. That's boring. Okay, I'm going to move it over here just so we get another view of what the spiral ganglia can look like. There you go. Inner ear anatomy. Okay, pulling it up, pulling it up, pulling it up. All right, over here. Keep going. See that same picture we had here? Okay. But I'll show you here, here, here. Oh, here. Here we go. Spiral ganglia. Spiral ganglia. Spiral ganglia. 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 Now, please don't think you have one, two, three, four, five, six spiral ganglia. Okay? You've got thousands of them. They're going. This just happens to be a cross section. But you can see how one axon is really short and the other axon is longer. Okay, that's really what I'm trying to get at here. So here's another picture of, here's the hair cells. Have a look here. And here's one axon from the hair cells to here. Here's a spiral ganglia. Okay, a gang of cell bodies. They're going to beat the heck out of you. Watch it. Okay, they're a gang of them. They look like little olives, little eyes looking at you. This is one spiral ganglia. And then you'll have another one, and another one, and another one, and another one. Up the two and a half coils of the cochlea. Okay? Here's they're trying to show you a picture of a bit of the spiral ganglia here. So it's just to give you an idea. Again, from the inner hair cells, the axons go into the spiral ganglia, and then the longer one is going to the brain stem. Cool. All right. I'll shrink that picture back to normal again, make it a little smaller. Good. Okay. Now, here's a picture of an actual human live spiral ganglion. Okay. This arm would be going to the inner hair cells. These are the little eyeballs. Do you have a feeling you're being watched? Okay. This is gray area, and this would be white area. Anyway, now go. those are tuning curves, and I, I talked to you. Whoa, I don't want Skype. I'm good. I can just talk, go back to here. Okay. So from spinal cord through internal auditory meatus, I-A-M. Your ear canal, external auditory meatus. The tunnel from your cochlea to your brain stem is the internal auditory meatus. Okay. External one, you got an internal one. Meatus just means tunnel in Latin. Okay, meatus is a tunnel. Let us drive through the meatus. Okay, let's drive through the tunnel. All right, here we go. The eighth nerve is tonotopic. Okay, fibers from the apex are wrapped around the inside. Fibers from the base are wrapped around the outside. You saw that in the picture. Now, you, don't worry about this thing, myelin, blah, 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 blah. You've got 30,000 of these fibers. So how many inner hair cells do you have? 3,000. How many fibers are attached to each hair cell? 10. 10 times 3,000 is 30,000. That's quite a few. All right. Then you have running along the eighth nerve. Now, think you've got a great big highway. Going from Oklahoma City down to Dallas, all the way down to San Antonio, God knows, down to Houston. Okay, you got some long highway, interstate. And right along that interstate highway, you've got a wee little country bumpkin gravel road going the opposite way. That's going to be called the olivocochlear bundle. O-C-B. And that goes from the brain stem to the outer hair cells. So the inner hair cells 
attached to the eighth nerve going to the brain and then the olivocochlear bundle is a nerve lying right along the eighth nerve a little tiny country bumpkin road and it feeds the outer hair cells it is an e ferrant nerve leaving brain going to hair cells in a way the outer hair cells are like the muscles of the cochlea they're the moving part remember okay all right eighth nerve tuning curves we bored you to tears about that in 110 so i'll just bug you slowly just to torture you and do you once again here okay looking at this picture you'll see six tuning curves that's because we went up to this particular cochlea and we took six fibers. We just picked six fibers at random. And tuning curves just show you that the eighth nerve is tonotopic. That's all they show you. They, they sh watch. This eighth nerve fiber is tuned to this frequency. This little piggy is attuned to that frequency. This little piggy went home. It's attached to that particular frequency. So you'll see six different fibers and they have a favorite characteristic frequency meaning in english that the softest intensity required to get that fiber to fire is at one particular frequency okay and if i try to get this fiber to fire with a lower frequency i've got to make it a lot louder and if i try to get that fiber to fire with a higher frequency i've got to go to the moon so eighth nerve tuning curves are just indicators that the eighth nerve is tonotopic, just like the cochlea is. Enough on that. You had this picture earlier. We talked about it in acoustics. We don't need to go into it again. We're just saying that with sensory neural loss, your tuning curves are more shallow. You are more easily masked by other frequencies. Carry on. Enough on that. I don't want to hear about it. Let's talk about the pathologies. This matches your field and mine. If you look closely here, you'll see the eighth nerve going through the internal auditory meatus, that little tunnel. Here's your out external auditory meatus, internal. And here's a tumor, a little tumor growing along the eighth nerve. Now here you can see the cochlear nerve, it says, they're showing you an arrow. Here's the seventh nerve. They're showing you here again. They're, they run right through the external, the internal auditory meatus. And if you let this tumor grow, it's really going to grow. Okay, it's going to get very large because now it's left the internal auditory meatus. Now it got through that tunnel and now it's in soft matter. And the brain is soft. I mean, really, I'm going to stop sharing for a second and tell you something. If you took out someone's brain, okay, if you laid it on the table, the brain wouldn't stay like a round brain. It would go, it would kind of flatten out. Okay, your brain is soft. The only reason they show you brains in school like they're made out of rubber is because they've been pickled in formaldehyde. When you formal, put, pickle something in formaldehyde, then literally you can bounce it like a rubber ball. Okay, But the brain itself is very soft. So if I stop sharing here and show you how a tumor, okay, here's the seventh nerve, here's the eighth nerve. Look at how that whole brain stem is bent. A tumor growing like the size of an orange it's totally going to squeeze things, okay? And that's what tumors do in the brain. And the eighth nerve tumor isn't cancerous. It's not malignant, but you will still die. It's a benign tumor. Benign just means you can see the tumor, all of it. Malignant just means that the tumor is like a spider web, and it's all through your brain. You can't get it. Okay, you can't get, you can't take out a spider tentacles that are growing all through your brain. You can't take that out. But if a, if, if a tumor is like an egg, yeah, you can. You can get it. You can excise around the tumor and get it out, okay? So the eighth nerve tumor is that kind, okay? But the trouble is it can grow rapidly, and then it can squeeze your brain stem, and it can kill you. Now, your brain stem, how thick is your brain stem? Thick as a pencil. How long is your brain stem? About this long. 
How long is your eighth nerve? About an inch. So this is about an inch. That's about an inch. All the stuff we're talking about is fairly small, okay? The eighth nerve is like a thread, very thin, okay? And it's made of thousands of fibers. Your brain stem is about a little bit thicker than a pencil, but basically about like a pencil. I knew you'd come into some use pencil. Good. All right. Next. <laughs> okay, good stuff. I'm having an okay time here. I'm just, this is a long day and it's a good one. What the hey? Okay. So now we're looking at a cross section of the internal auditory meatus. Here's your seventh nerve. Here's the vestibular portion of your eighth nerve. Here's your auditory portion of your eighth nerve. And you can see that high frequencies are on the outside and lower frequencies are on the inside. Now they're showing you more of a schematic. Vestibular portion, inferior portion of your vestibular nerve, facial nerve, your seventh nerve. This is your internal auditory meatus, the tunnel. Here's the acoustic portion of your eighth nerve, and here's a tumor. So the tumor is going to be squeezing on all these nerves. So it isn't just like a problem at hearing. The person's going to have facial tingling. The person's going to have balance problems. There's going to be a whole constellation of problems with regarding an eighth nerve tumor. And this is one of the red flags for the HIS. When you have asymmetrical sensory neural loss, that's a red flag for an eighth nerve tumor. Okay? That's when you need to refer to an audiologist or a doctor. Look, if you're aging, you're, your ears are going to age the same. You're going to get similar hearing loss in both ears. If you're getting noise-induced hearing loss, you might have more in one ear than the other ear. Maybe you're a hunter and you're a right-handed hunter. Your left ear is going to get most of the sound. Maybe you're a trucker and your left window is open. Okay, So, yeah, you may have asymmetrical hearing loss, but that's if you took a good case history, you'd know why. But if you've got a 30-year-old mother of three kids, and she's telling you, and she's a librarian, and she's all of a sudden losing hearing in one ear, and you've done a test and you found out it is not otitis media, she does not have an ear infection, so she doesn't have a conductive hearing loss, she has a sensory neural hearing loss, okay? And you'll learn how to do this in audiometry in 130. So when you start getting that, you need to refer her out of your office pronto she has a she's a positive indication of an eighth nerve tumor you gotta go into surgery they'll probably deafen her she'll probably lose the hearing in that ear but she'll live okay that's a it's one of the how many people get an eighth nerve tumor one in a hundred thousand so in springfield missouri you might have about 150,000 people so maybe one and a half people in Springfield have an eighth nerve tumor. I don't know how half a person has a tumor, but you know what I mean. Okay? They're rare, but they're quite potentially fatal. And that's one of the red flags that the HIS has to look at is retrocochlear pathology. And that's what it's called, retro behind cochlear pathology. And the main one is eighth nerve tumor. Tuma, as they say in German. Yeah, you don't want to have a tumor. Okay, so this is kind of weird. This is a test that audiologists do. And I want you to know what the acronym is. It's called an ABR. Go away, black bar. I can't stand there. Okay, now, the ABR, oh, yeah, right, just because I talked about it. The ABR stands for auditory brainstem response. ABR, auditory brainstem response. This is in your PowerPoints, and what the audio and audiologists are taught how to do this. So, if you walk a few blocks from the OTC campus over to Missouri State University, okay, and look at their AUD program, they are learning ABR. I did this at University of Oklahoma too. My doctoral dissertation was in the ABR. Now, the ABR is really cool. You take an electrode, you pin it on this earlobe. You take an electrode, you pin it on that earlobe, and you take another electrode, and right at the hairline, right at the middle, you put an electrode right there. Then you put headphones on the guy. I'll let you see me here. So now you got an electrode here, here, and right here. 
and you put headphones on and out of the headphones comes these weird little sounds like they call them clicks and each click each makes a brainwave but the brain waves are so small that they have to give you thousands of those clicks and when they give you thousands of them in a row, you begin to see waves. And on the left and on the right, you'll see five bumps. Okay, you'll see one, two, three, four, and five. A, B, R. Now, this is a test done to check babies' hearing. Because when I make the sounds 80, I got five bumps, make them 60, the bumps are still there, but smaller. 40, you still see one bump. 20, I still see a bump. I see a bump over there. That must mean that the baby can hear 20 decibels, no? I can do the same thing in the other ear, no? And down here, I can say with safety, hey, guess what? The baby's got pretty good hearing. I did an ABR, and these are brain waves coming from the, get this, peak one is from the inner hair cells. Peak two is from where the eighth nerve meets the brain stem. Peak three, middle of the brain stem. Peaks four and five, top of the brain stem. You have checked the integrity of the eighth nerve and the brain stem. Think of the eighth nerve horizontal brain stem going up. And that's why they call it the auditory brain stem response, but it's also used to test for tumors. Okay, so if you look for tumors, come on, there you go, oops, here, tumor. So let's say the 30 year old mother of three that came to your office and is saying, yeah, you know, I can't talk on the phone in my left ear anymore. I mean, normally my left ear, that's my talking ear. I usually hold the phone here. And I've noticed over the past half a year, my hearing seems to be fading in that ear. Oh, do you have any pain in that ear? Does it? Nope. You look in, you do an otoscopic exam, eardrum looks normal. You do a hearing test on her, no middle ear pathology. She has no history of noise exposure. Do, 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 do. Refer to an audiologist. Get her out of your office. The audiologist will hook her up to an ABR. In the right ear, where there was no problem, the five bumps. And when I make the sound softer, I still see the bumps. Make the sound softer, I still see the bumps. But now look at the left ear. Look at how the ABR is spread out. Look at how the distance between the peaks is increased. That's a tumor. Uh oh, you have a tumor. Because you may not have much hearing loss at all. Maybe the hearing loss is like 10 or 20 decibels. It's not even a big hearing loss. But you've screwed up the passageway of information to the brain. And the ABR is abnormal. Maybe the hearing loss is only slight. Guess what? At 70 dB, your ABR is gone. Okay? It's supposed to look like that. Okay? Even Stephen between the ears. But uh-uh. Okay? You've got an eighth nerve tumor. So that's a test. ABR, auditory brainstem response. And now read with me for fun. Here's an article. It's a true story from up in Canada about a woman who had an eighth nerve tumor. And that's why I gave it to you in your PowerPoints. If you take a read of this, and I'll just sort of synopsize it quickly here for you. Acoustic neuroma caught our family. Acoustic neuroma. Every time you see the word oma, okay, it doesn't mean Dutch for grandmother. Oma means tuma, okay? Acoustic neuroma caught our family by surprise. In 1992, my wife experienced equilibrium, balance problems, and loss of hearing in her left ear. Doctor thought it might be an inner ear problem, told her to stop taking salt and stop drinking coffee. Referred her for an ABR, brain stem auditory evoked response. They call it a BAER, but it's just weird. Anyway, the test which should have detected the tumor was inconclusive. Oh, that time the ABR didn't work so well. Within a few weeks, the symptoms subsided. We thought the salt and caffeine had been the cause. She began to notice a loss of sensation in her teeth, gums, and tongue. 
Her doctor suggested she check with a dentist. Huh. She was finally referred to an ENT who sent her for a CAT scan. It revealed a three centimeter tumor. It's a little longer than an inch. Growing along her auditory nerve. We were stunned by the diagnosis. We were looking for a simple problem. Uh-uh. Neurologist told us more about it. They went and got support from the Neuroma Society of Canada. Acoustic neuroma is a benign tumor that grows around the nerve sheath from the inner ear through an opening in the skull, internal auditory meatus, to the brain. The tumor grows slowly, putting pressure on the nerves in the opening of the, and eventually on the brain stem itself. And that's what I showed you earlier in that picture, the whole brain stem bending. As the nerve sheath is compressed, it causes deafness, loss of facial sensation, tinnitus, ringing in the ear, other symptoms. If left untreated, you will die. Statistically, one in a hundred thousand people in North America are diagnosed each year. Treatment includes usually surgery. So in her case, the surgery lasted nine hours, during which they cut behind her left ear and then they went through the cochlea to get it, a trans cochlear trans labyrinthine approach so now she's deaf in that ear they got the tumor out but the result was partial facial paralysis because they damaged part of the seventh facial nerve in removing it so can you imagine the facial paralysis for a young woman walking around how would you like to be Mrs. Jones walking in the grocery store like this? Hi. The whole place is distorted because you've ruined that eighth nerve and you, you take the tumor out, but you also damaged the seventh nerve. So no longer do you have two equal tensions on your cheeks. Uh-uh. Only this seventh nerve works. This one doesn't. Imagine the dist How would you feel? You know, walking around like that. So they sometimes do a type of surgery where they do a neural graft so that when Mrs. Jones, like, puts her tongue behind her front teeth, the face goes normal. So as long as she walks around, like, with the tongue touching the back of her front teeth, her face will go normal. But if she takes that away, so it's... These are things. This is, this is medical problems, and you are in a quasi-medical field. So we just want to take some time to express some of the, a uh, bit of the gravity of that situation. It's kind of weird. So she, they volunteer with the Acoustic Neuroma Society, and she's combating the pain, the pain and she's beginning to compensate for one-sided hearing and lingering dizziness, works daily to maintain the symmetry of her face through facial stretches and exercise. So Quite a trip, huh? I mean, it's unreal. So we're just about done here today, but not quite, almost. Ah, let's just see. We're, ah, you know, it's getting toward the end of the semester. We got to lighten up. And, but here we go. So da, 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 tuning curves, boring, boring. Okay, we've covered all of that stuff already. We'll just carry on down here. Not to worry about these things. We kind of looked at that, air, that stuff before. Pathology of the eighth nerve. And that's what we that's what we are talking about now. Retrochochlear, eighth nerve pathology is almost always unilateral. It's never both ears. Okay, that's what that's what the red flag is: unilateral sensory neural hearing loss, and also very poor speech recognition. Have you learned in any of your studies about the test called speech discrimination testing? You will in audiometry, okay? The speech discrimination of the person with an eighth nerve tumor is terrible. Even if the hearing loss is mild, even if the, the eighth nerve tumor is causing like a 20 decibel hearing loss, you're going to have terrible speech recognition in that ear. ABR will be abnormal, dizziness, tinnitus are, are things here, auditory brainstem response. It's an electrophysiological test, just basically done with electrodes, and you're looking at the screen. So basically, next week, which is our last week, we will be looking at the central auditory nervous system. And next week, 
I want to show you some slides from my daughter's brain. And I want to show you her CAT scans and some of her MRIs. We're going to be looking at auditory areas of the brain. But I also want to kind of end on a nice, just a more touching note, just on a more personal note, and share with you some things that way. But So we've done the eighth nerve now. So now we've got the last part is the central auditory nervous system, where we'll study a little bit about the auditory areas of the brain itself. But you and I as HISs aren't doing that. The only people who look at that are teachers, audiologists in elementary schools. For boys, usually boys that are bouncing off the walls, they can hear, they just can't listen. <laughs> My wife always tells me that, okay? You can hear you're just not listening, okay? It's they can hear, but they can't pay attention. They have learning disabilities. What's wrong with those kids? We'll look a little bit about that because that's really the only auditory disorder of the brain. The disorders course that you will take with me this coming summer will be covering otitis media, cholesteatoma, otosclerosis, noise-induced loss, presbycusis, eighth nerve tumor, all of this stuff again, but we'll be focusing on the disorders, not so much the anatomy. You took the anatomy to know what's normal. If you've got a bad knee, your doctor's first going to look at your good knee to find out what's normal for you and then look at your bad knee. Okay? It's the same with anatomy. You've got to know what's normal first before you study what's pathological. So this anatomy course is to tell you what's normal, and we dipped a little bit into abnormalities, not much, a little bit, but you remember you have a whole disorders course, and I think it's called uh, HEAR 125, and I think that's, that's a six-week course offered in the summer, and we'll focus on that as well. Anyway, any questions? Cool. All right. Sayonara. Adios. Thanks. All right, See you later. as they say in Britain, cheers, oh, quite. <laughs> All righty. Did you know that the Queen has had her 70th, 70th wedding anniversary? Can you imagine being married 70, 7 oh. oh, Good grief. Anyway, cheers. <laughs> See you.